Well, but yeah, uh, I finished up sniper school and then I wound up, uh, this was actually before sniper school, I wound up at Jumpmaster. Again, showed up to the company spaces and they're like, hey, we've got X amount of seats, each team's gonna give up a guy. And they're like, who here has jumped the most? And like, all of us had done a static line jumping. Because on in an in a MSOT, Marine Special Operations team, they have specific insert methods for them. So a company had, had three teams, now it has four teams. But you had a, you had a uh, jump team, and they, that's free fall. Mm -hmm. You had a mobility team, you had a special reconnaissance team, and then you basically had a, uh, I wanna get in trouble here, you had a special team. And so that, that special team still had, all of them still had airborne. Mm -hmm. So when the army says uh, jump, they mean low level static line. And I had about 30 jumps when I went to, to jump master. And uh, you wanna talk about a school that is just a meat grinder where they, they're like, hey, we have 80 people, we're gonna probably graduate 20. There's guys that have been there like three, four times and like, you, you go through the, the everything that happens from soup to nuts for a jump operation, from prepping all your equipment to doing your calculations to fixing people's rigs and then getting in the aircraft and then doing PWAC and then, you know, you can jump out of anything that will open a door from 130 to 90 miles an hour in the air. Mm. So helicopters, fixed wing, um, 22s, garbage, oh. the Ospreys, Oh, fuck yeah, they are. And they're just fucking, that's the most anxiety I've ever gotten in my life is being a jump master stuck on an Osprey. And like, don't get me wrong, uh, like it earned its reputation of being called the North Carolina Long Dart. Because the way that they use them, the way the Marine Corps uses them is they kind of put them in roles that they shouldn't be used. Whereas the Air Force actually has them. Air Force Special Operations has them. I did not know that. They've never had one crash. Hmm. I, I might be wrong. I might. I might wouldn't be wrong. literally just fucking crash the horse. Yeah, in the Marine Corps, there's a lot of problems with it and how it stalls when you wind up in a going from a rotor, which is lift, to forward drive, and if they're banking and there's there's just something like if you're not paying attention, the pilot will basically hit dirty air and belly up. But I uh, I did jump master, and then I went to scout sniper and. Uh, after Scout Sniper, I came back, and again, they're like, uh, I think I did a, <coughs> I can't remember if I did a deployment between then. I wound up going to SOTAC, which is JTAC for Special Operations. And because uh, I had a fires background as an FO, and I had worked for air officers at JTACs, and I had called thousands of nine lines uh, throughout the, those years, I think it was about eight years, maybe. Um, I wound up going to JTAC, and I, it was interesting because when they started up the language program at MARSOC, they basically went down the line and said, all right, we need five guys from each team. You're going six months to language. Well, just so happens, they're like, well, you're gonna go to JTAC, so we're not gonna send you to a language. And I was fine by that because like, I lived overseas 14 years and did not pick up anything, okay? I'm the ugly American, 100%, <laughs> can barely speak English. So I wind up, <laughs> wind up doing JTAC, and you have some really interesting things that happen because you have you have uh, you have this aircraft that's piloted by a college graduate, multi-million dollar aircraft, millions of dollars of training, and the person on the ground is is a, a guy with a radio and a GED or a diploma calling it in. And it, if you don't know anything well, about little shit, now for the army, yeah, you ain't mm -hmm. gotta have that. Mm -hmm. You just fucking waltz right in off the street. The the, uh, the JTAC, I wound up as the team JTAC, and I wound up as an element sniper. How MSOTs are, are put together is it's a 14-man team. You have one officer, the rest are enlisted. Of those enlisted, two are Navy guys that go to the 18th Delta Special Operation Medical Course at Fort Bragg. So they are, the, they are very similar, if not the same as an 18th Delta on a Special Forces team. And so these guys have gone through 94 weeks of medical training. God damn. And 94 weeks of medical training, they, they have a bridge course now where you can go and get, they come out with a degree. It's, I, I'm not saying they're a PA with a gun, but they're pretty fucking close. And special, special amphibious reconnaissance corpsmen called SARCs are some, it's one of the coolest jobs in the world. And it's very difficult. So you show up, you go through field med after course school, 
and then you go to BRC, which is basic reconnaissance course. That's three months of getting your sh shit kicked in and getting yeah. made fun of being as a sailor around a bunch of Marines. Then you go to dive school. When you get done with dive school, then at some point you go to uh, to brag for 94 fucking weeks. Then you have to do dive med. And then by the time you get back to your team, you've been in probably three years and you have had your soul crushed with everything medical. I mean, they do yeah. EMT in 30 days. Of course, that takes six months for civilians. They do it in 30 days. There's a one week, in one week they learn over 200 medications. I can't speak highly enough about SARCs because- That's fucking amazing. There's two on a team. And so like if you do split team ops, they have a junior and a senior. Similar to how- If you know one of those guys, <laughs> do, bring him fucking, bring him on. Let's, let's I, do a fucking three way here. I, I'm not in that way. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll see if a couple of my buddies want to come down. Um, and then you have an EOD tech, the only soft EOD tech. There are EOD techs in the army and some other places that work in conjunction. They're not organic to the team. Marsoc mm -hmm. is the only one that has that. Then you have a, so your team leader is a captain. Uh, you have your EOD tech, you have a team chief and an ops chief. And your team chief runs, every, so your team leader is a captain runs up. All his information goes up and out. It goes to the SODIF, it goes to the company headquarters, it goes to adjacent unit commanders. Your team chief handles coordination below and peer. So coordinating with other teams, coordinating between the two elements. And then you have your ops chief who has a background in communications and a couple other things. There's, a, there's some really glaring stuff that I'm not gonna cover, but your, your operations chief, when you split a team, your team chief and your operations chief usually split. And if you are gonna start a mission with a team that has to go somewhere else, so you start a mission, they're like, hey, we need to start putting our guys here to help this unit out or whatever, the ops chief takes those guys. Yeah. So that's your foreman in the uh, in the headquarters element. Then you have two, uh, we'll call it DAS, or, or Direct Action Special Reco Reconnaissance Elements, and they're five-man assault teams, two of them. And on those assault teams, you have a SARC in each one, a Special Amphibious Reconnaissance Corpsman, and then you have four CSOs, or Critical Skills Operators. You have an element leader, assistant element leader, and then you have your two, your two shooters. The assistant element leader is usually sniper qualified or qualified in some other fashion. For me, I was an element leader as a JTAC and the sniper. So sometimes I got pulled to go with the captain for JTAC stuff. Sometimes I would go out on teams that had, uh, for, for training, we do like a recce team. So I could control aircraft. I had a long gun and I had uh, like a 117 in my backpack. So I was just weighed the fuck down on top of like the sniper load. Yeah, and, the load. Um, and then while I was out in California, we did a lot of VBSS, visit for search and seizure. Um, and it was basically how you capture a ship. And you see some of this stuff on YouTube, like the Iranians fast roping in. Uh, dude, anybody with a Mac 10 could take that thing out if they knew what they were doing, like an opposed boarding. And it yeah. can be it can be kind of difficult when you're hitting these ships. So there's different fashions. There's like a, a bottom up, top down. Bottom up is boats come in, you hook, you climb onto it. Top down is you fast rope on. Nine times out of 10, if you're seeing a, a fast rope going on, they've already boarded it and set it up for their propaganda because there's no fucking way you're gonna put an entire helicopter at risk to get sh shot down. So yeah. you'll usually have guys, and you could do it in different methods. You could drop them off in the water so that when the ship is passing by, you can get on there. That's the most difficult. Most of the time you would stalk in the wake and you'd hook up and get up onto the boat and then you'd start clearing and taking the priority spaces. So you take the bridge, you take aft steering, you take the radio room, you take the engine room. And you don't have to control the whole boat in order to make it stop. You just need to be able to get, get key elements. Yeah, clear, yeah. clear certain areas so that when the you bring on what's called prize crew, and those are like your master mariner, they're all Navy guys. Yeah. They're, they're kind of scary because they give them like an M9, and they're not qualified to clear ships. <laughs> so the ship has to be down for you to get these guys on board. And sometimes you could be waiting there for a couple hours before they bring them in. And uh, you'll find yourself in the sounds gun. like sounds like the whole classic standby and wait bullshit. Yep. We're still going. Okay. Um. Uh, so my alcoholic thing. <laughs>
So I wound up finishing my time up at uh, First Raider Battalion. They had changed it. Um, and then I wound up, this is like 2016 time frame. And I wound up coming over here to the East Coast again uh, to the schoolhouse. That was the Marine Special Operations School and they changed it to the Marine Raider Training Center. Uh, when I showed up, I was supposed to have one job, and that was the training chief and in the S3. And the training chief at the schoolhouse is different than, say, a training chief at the battalion. The training chief at the battalion coordinates, like, school noms and stuff like that. Yeah. I was the guy that was handling all these nominations coming from adjacent units, so first, second, and third, coming from the Army. So it was flowing in, and I had, like, basically direct columns to the, to the, to the G7, G1, and G5. And I learned so much about the robust structure about special operations. Then somebody got fired, the guy that was filling the operations, uh, the uh, ops planner, the operations planner, they're like, okay, well, you're going to fill that too. And that was like a master sergeant position. So I was staff sergeant trying to talk to like all these senior master sergeants, master guns, and GSs. And anytime I open my mouth, they're just like, shut the fuck up. And, and, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Did that whole thing. And so I did that for a year. Um, and I wound up seeing everything when you're talking about how MARSOC is laid out, how USASOC is laid out, how NASPEC WARCOM is laid out. Didn't do much with AFSOC. I sent their guys to our SEER school. So our SEER schools that we ran in-house in MARSOC, about one out of every four would be for the ITC students. And they would run the whole class through the SEER school. When there wasn't an ITC class going through or on deck, they would, it was a hodgepodge. You had guys that hadn't been, most of them were enablers or facilitators from yeah. the battalions, and then a lot of guys from uh, the Army. And then uh, I, I wound up uh, finishing that whole portion and seeing everything and I was like okay well now I need to go to, in my instructor time on so I wound up going to the special reconnaissance branch where it was like snipers EOD and they handled the uh, reconnaissance portion of ITC and so I did that for two years and I was like I'm tired of getting shipped back and forth I don't get to pick what I'm gonna do because the next thing that they would have me do so I've already done team J attack sniper element leader uh, I, would, I had no say in where I was going. And uh, I had talked to a buddy of mine that was a contractor at our, uh, at our advanced sniper course, and he's like, hey, you should go check out uh, the Army Special Forces National Guard. I was like, okay, I'll, I'll go do that. Um, so COVID hit, right as I'm getting out. Um, I wound up, it, they said it takes like two weeks to do your steps and taps and stuff. You know, four weeks. I even faxed something. I've never faxed anything. <laughs> and I have wound up faxing uh, this. It was, a, it was a whole ordeal. But uh, wow, I couldn't imagine doing steps and taps that way. Fuck that. Um, funny story. Okay. So uh, if, you, if you've ever worked aircraft and like you've had to signal to the aircraft, there's a multitude of different ways to do it. You can do it sometimes electronically through a beacon or you can have lasers on the ground if it's nighttime, you can start a big ass fire. Any way to get their attention. <laughs> fucking smoke signals. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's crazy. Uh, even like, uh, I didn't believe this until like they showed me it, but like uh, your little signal gear, do that. You can see that for hundreds of miles. The little fucking. The little signal gear. The thing that you had in boot camp, like a little mirror. A little tiny thing, yeah. What the fuck? Yeah, so there's uh, SF even used it for close air support in the first Gulf War. There was, a, there was an SF team that was getting attacked by a fucking Iraqi brigade. And they wound up using this signal here. It was basically friendly centric cast. The, the aircraft were like, okay, those are friendlies. Those are not friendlies. <laughs> it's a pretty, you. pretty interesting. Well, sometimes, like, especially helicopters, uh, you set up these load signs. Uh, you set up a T, set up a V, set up a NATO Y, and... Uh, there was a team that was exfilling in Afghanistan, and uh, this team wound up uh, taking this area, and wound up in a gunfight, they won the fight, and they started to do their ex uh, go through and say exploit the area. And they had finished up, they had grabbed everything that they needed, and they were waiting for pickup. And some of the junior guys thought it would be funny to set these guys, set these bodies of the Taliban out. And uh, the funniest thing for this helicopter pilot, he's landing. There's been a gunfight, so he's probably already like already fucking wired. Yeah. yeah. And he's he's flying in, 
and he looks down and these guys had arranged the bodies in a Y M C A. They had arranged them in a Y. Fuck yeah. <laughs> and uh, some people didn't think it was funny, especially like more senior guys. They're like, hey, you can't do that. That's, that's not professional. That's not professional. And it was just funny. That was one of the funnier stories uh, of signaling to aircraft. Um, Another one was, uh, I was uh, training in uh, Nevada and we were working with the Emiratis. And the Emiratis are flying French Mirage 2000s. Pretty, for the, for the time period, it was a pretty good airframe. And the Emiratis that fly are all princes. Like, their brightling on their wrist is more than I have in my life. And so, they were goofy because they have to speak English. We have, all pilots have to speak English. Mm -hmm. To include like the like worst one I ever dealt with, a, a French Canadian. I could not oh, understand this God. Dude. And so his navigator, his Lizzo, had to talk to me, not the not the pilot himself, because I could not understand what he was. Such a thick Quebecois accent. Quebec. Quebecois. It's like the the French. The, like it's you're like thinking. The legions from up there. <laughs> <laughs> Like Shorzy or uh, Letter Kenny. Uh, Letter Kenny. <laughs> yeah, so, so just yes, like you've seen that. Just like that. If you've seen the Letter Kenny episode of the Quebec Qua group, just imagine they're flying around a fighter aircraft and trying to talk to you playing uh, I Spy from and then like you have, 30,000 feet. And then you have Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so we're, we're up there and we're doing close air support training, cast training. And uh, you're, in most places, you're not allowed to use ordnance that explode. It's got to be either simulated or it's basically just dumb bombs with these kits strapped onto them, whether it's a laser seeker or a GPS. Did they use fucking Cheeto buff? No. There, so there are some that will do that. they will land and it, you'll see a plume. It, it's, I can't remember how they do it. It's essentially concrete. Once it breaks uh, apart, it'll pull it up. Yeah. But these guys just had straight concrete with um, a laser guided system on it. And when I was talking to them, you build up this game plan uh, on how you're going to attack the target. Because you got to tell them what's going on because they're just showing up. Yeah. And so you do your fire to fact. And they had some, the best way to describe it is if you had a small kid in the back seat and you're going on a long drive. They're just asking you just random wild questions. And you're just <laughs> like, uh, you're just kind of like, uh, okay, man. So <laughs> these dudes show up and they get into the area and they look down. And it's, uh, it's basically a gorge. And we're up here and there's like a little town down there. Um, like a cast simulator town. So it looks yeah. kind of like a really broke ass mouth town. That's what like, I was about yeah. to say. Like, yeah, like containers yeah. and stuff. But there's a couple buildings there, and they were we were. It was one of the places we could do live, but not explosive. So again, these concrete, concrete deals. So we're sitting up there, and uh, we're getting an eval an evaluation. So as a JTAC, you have like a, a certain amount of time before it'll lapse, and you have to get requalified. Yeah. And so you have like small evals. And then you have the big ones that matter. It's like an 18 month or something. I can't even remember now. So my buddy's up and my whole thing is to run the laser and to listen in case he misses something. I could tap him and be like, hey, you forgot this or your line six, whatever was in his brief. He delivers the uh, fighter to fact. It was great with a situation update. He sent in his uh, type of nine line so that he could look at the target and then he could assess the nose position of the aircraft. And so these guys wanted to do, um, they wanted to basically fly one aircraft in, drop, peel off. The second one would be in 30 seconds later, kind of like the smoke clear, yeah. so that they could use their instruments. And then the JTAC would have to make a quick, in his head, mathematical shift from where the lead aircraft hit. And so they're flying in, and the whole time this guy is just, he's, a, he's like talking about the area. And we, they had these random donkeys. They're called wild donkeys. They're called burrows. And these burrows are just milling about the target area. And so this guy, he's like sitting there. He's like, uh, the JTAC is talking to the pilot. And the pilot's like, yes, yes. And the JTAC's like, okay, do you see this? And he's like describing it. The orientation of the building, the, the car, the wreck cars around yeah. it. The, and so it's like, do you see this? Yes. Do you see this? Yes. And then they're going back and forth. And he would just say, yes, okay, yes, okay. And so he finally gets him to where he's pretty confident the pilot knows where it's at. And, and so he, he, uh, he tells him, hey, I want lead to come in, dash two to come in 30 seconds later. And uh, you have to give them basically uh, uh, an abort criteria as well as a cleared hot criteria. And cleared hot's pretty simple. You just say cleared hot. 
that allows them to drop as they're coming in. They have to give a final attack heading. So it's kind of strict and regimented. At any point, they can say you can say abort or they can abort themselves. So lead comes in. He's still talking about these donkeys. He's like, oh, there's movement in the uh, target area. And he, it sounded like Borat. I'm not going to show you. <laughs> there was movement in target area. And he's like, Should yes, yes. He's okay. like, that's not part of the scenario. He's like, okay, but what is that? And he's like, he's like trying to coordinate all this stuff, using geometry, <laughs> making sure that he doesn't fuck this up because it's on him. He's got an eval. And so he's like looking at down and he's like, uh, they're, they're animals. And then he goes back and... It's kind of quiet, and he's like, okay, what, what kind of animal is this? And he's just like, uh, they're, they're just wild animals. And he's like, okay, uh, in heading, gave a number. JTAC looked down, and he's like, okay, that's right. He's like, uh, we'll call it Bone 11. Bone 11 cleared hot. And bone 11, okay. Bone 11 comes in, he drops, pulls off, uh, shacks the target, hits the right target, right building. These guys are really good flyer, uh, really good at flying, really good at hitting the target. And so he looks down, he looks over, the evaluator goes, okay, you have guys that just ran into this building. And he goes, he goes to tell the second aircraft. Second aircraft hasn't said he's in, he hasn't said anything. And he says, you know, bone one, two, his wingman that's coming in. He's like, hey, bone one, two from Leeds hits like Southeast a uh, hundred meters. Uh, building and I mean, describe it I'm not really saying exactly how it went but he goes okay bombs away and then we all just kind of freeze because there was no final attack heading the guy basically just said uh, Leroy Jenkins like, <laughs> yeah, he, goes, Leroy yeah, he, he goes okay bombs away and like everybody just kind of was like oh god and sure as shit hits the target, but completely didn't do what he was supposed to when it came to the safety protocols of his basket and how he was supposed to fly in and all this other stuff. He just said, fuck it. Yeah, and then, so they finished up and they um, they headed out and uh, we later went to a debrief and there was a Navy, because there were Navy pilots there and these uh, Emirati pilots, uh, UAE pilots, and they would not stop asking what kind of animal it was, even throughout the debrief. These are guys with college, they're princes in the Emirati military. Like, they are big cheese. And they, it was like a small kid. They were like, what kind of animal is this? What it's kind like, of animal? Why are you asking that? In, in, in the U.S. military, when you're delivering a nine line, it's only pertinent information. You yep. make your talkies quick, and you ensure that everybody's safe while you do it. Um, so those, those are a couple of funny, funny stories from that. Um, and then uh, I can talk a little bit about ITC. Yeah. If you want to, yeah. So when uh, the Marine Corps has a very interesting way of doing special operations, um, how it works is you have to have done time in the Marine Corps and you have to be a certain rank. So that allows some lance corporals, corporals, sergeants. That's kind of like what they're looking the, for. The, yeah, the base. There's a lot of guys that are like, I. I what about um, officers? Officers, senior, uh, senior first lieutenants, and junior captains. They don't really allow much for that. When it first started off in 2006, 2007, there were majors that were going through, there were second lieutenants, they were big, gathering data as this was going and it was kind of a work in progress. So there yeah. were some majors that went to selection. There were quite a few guys that came from the original MSOBs that either did selection and didn't do ITC, they did selection, went back to a team. There were guys that didn't go to selection that wound up at ITC. And it was a hodgepodge. So you'll run into instructors or even senior uh, CSOs now that didn't do either of those. They were reconnaissance Marines and they got grandfathered in. You had some guys that, you know, again, did selection yeah. but didn't wind up doing uh, ITC. So it was a hodgepodge. So you had some guys that showed up. A lot of our instructors, when I went through ITC, had not been to selection or ITC. And they there was a lot of them that were in the mindset of, I'm going to fuck you up no matter what happens. So you're going to pay with paying, it pays to be a winner, you know, doing a, a four hour pool session. And by the time of it, you've had like 10 dudes quit. So just drive you. Yeah. Um, so with, uh, with selection, there's, there's no, is it ANS first? Yeah, it's, it's ANS. It used to be called RSAS, which was recruitment, screening and assessment and selection. Now it's just colloquially known as ANS assessment and selection. Um, I'm not going to go into like what they do. Um, I can tell you this, I was a green suitor, so I was a Marine cadre member of the selection. So I'd, already, I'd been to selection, now I was a Marine cadre member at the selection. 
when I got out, I actually contracted for selections. So I've been, I've done, I think by this time, nine selections. 10 if you include the one I personally went through. And there's nothing out there for, for MARSOC selection that is gonna give you an answer. There's no fucking book. There's no special, special SME. There's no some guy that knows the ins and outs. There are people that have books out there. They're bullshit. And I can tell you that because I was, I was literally showed up and I was teaching knots. And I stop and I see that this guy had a book and it was written by a guy who got out, pretty much got kicked out. He's a turd. Um, he's more than that, but we're not gonna get into that. He'll get all upset. I turned and I was like, hey, did anybody else buy this book? And of course, everybody's like quiet, think they're in trouble. And I was like, if you have this book, do not fucking do anything this guy tells you. You will fail selection. All you have to do is do exactly what the cadre tell you. And they give you a, like now they have like apps for working out yeah. and you go through the beginning of it. They teach you certain things like how to think, like tactical decision games. You'll be in an auditorium and they'll talk about scenarios that have happened to SF teams in Vietnam. And it's, it's historical stuff. You get, you can show up and not know anything. As long as you are mature and you have effective intelligence and you're physically capable, you'll have no problems. The guys that show up and they read this book and they try to do these things, that get them kicked the fuck out. So it's as simple as right place, right time, right uniform, and be prepared to flex and also swim. That's literally it. People are like, that, that can't be it. There has to be more to it. And yeah. like, no, it's literally do what they tell you. It can't be any easier. There was uh, two guys, I, I think I mentioned this to you in the shops. So I had two NCOs when I was out in California when I was fucking baby boot, right? Vargo, stellar fucking dude. Like, pretty sure that dude shaved his fucking face in the Marine Corps him every goddamn time. <laughs> like, he could rattle off some fucking knowledge. He was a total dick as a corporal, too. Like, he was that, like, not approachable guy, yeah. right? Until after he came back from this, because yeah. I think it humbled him a lot. So he went, you know, he went to selection, and then he came back while he was waiting to be picked up by a recon team because he failed. And the way that he put it was, you could pass everything, mm -hmm. and at the end of it, mm -hmm. it was almost like not a popularity contest kind of thing, but it's the decision's not based on your performance throughout. It was based on several different factors, mm -hmm. one of them being like. If you were a like strict by the fucking book dude, mm -hmm. you're not gonna get fucking selected. Yep. That kind of that kind of deal. So he hit the mark on that. Well, it, and we're I know, pretty close. I know some. Oh, a good friend of mine. He actually became an officer now. Uh, he was enlisted. He was a drill instructor. You yeah. know that whole thing. Drill instructors yeah. they can never leave their campaign cover back at Paris Island or MCRD. He was pretty by the book, but he was also approachable. So you can still have that mindset. But, and like you said, you can go all the way through. through and they used to run a pre-course, it was a two week pre-course, called it uh, ASPOC. And it was a prep course. And it was to try and reduce the attrition that occurred in the first portions of, of selection. But yeah, it, you can go through the whole damn thing. And when it comes time and they separate you and they say who wins uh, or who gets selected and who's going home, you could, uh, there were guys there that were straight studs like they would have been the guide in boot camp they would have yep. taken the, the number one award at uh, sergeant's course and they didn't get selected that, that had to do with effective intelligence and your, your personality nobody wants to be on a deployment for nine fucking months in a combat zone with somebody that has a personality of a doorknob let me tell you that yep yeah you, you have to build rapport with people and I, I feel like he uh he definitely took that away from it because when he came back when he was just like hanging out at the unit, like waiting to be picked up by a team. He was just kind of, he was fucking chill as shit. Then we had Mendoza that went, and I don't know what happened to him. Like, I, I know he fell ANS, and I think he was trying to go EFD. Oh, no. I think that, like, that was a lot, because I, I left. He was actually my, uh, he got me up to Greenbelt, like the last, day, like the day I was fucking driving back over here, I stopped by the ramp real quick so I could have him sign my little fucking logbook <laughs> saying like I did all these fucking hours so when I got to the unit I could test out. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was 
in the same boat, but he was waiting to fucking hear back from EOD and shit. Because it was like all these other fucking units, like recon, EOD, and like force recon and shit, like reach out to you and like, if you fail, they reach out to you and like want to drag you in on their side kind of thing. So yeah. it's like, both, those were the only two dudes that I knew that went. Uh, I had a boot that was like gung ho as fuck about going. I don't know if he actually did or not. Duran, I don't know if you fucking went. <laughs> I don't know if you fucking made it. I don't think you did. I don't know. You got a beard now, so I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Anyway.